Christine Evans. Oh, thank you for recording that. <laughs> I always forget to hit that button. My name is Christine Evans, and I am the parent consultant that is contracted with Twelve County School District um, and the Utah Parent Center. And um, I'm also <laughs> newly um, designated as the Tooele Family to Family Network Leader, um, which uh, I am not well versed with the what what the network is. So I'll let um, my partner in crime, Julia Pierce, um, go over what the Family to Family Network does. Um, but I want to welcome you here to um, our workshop, and we're really excited to have Diane Passy uh, teaching with us. Um, let's see, a few housekeeping things before I turn things over to Julia and then to Diane. Um, I will be launching a poll um, probably the last five minutes to, and, and this is because we're a nonprofit, this it lets us um, improve our workshops and uh, get um, feedback from parents and professionals that join our workshops. So that will be happening the last five minutes. And also to those who have not picked up their um, care kits yet, they will be located at the Student Services Building in Twila, which is formerly Early Learning Center. It's across the street from the Catholic Church. It's 555 East Vine. Um, Candy Wilson is our uh, admin that's up front. You can talk to her or I'll be there tomorrow. I'm usually there from nine to three. Um, so you can also come by anytime during those hours and pick it up. I won't be there Friday, um, but somebody will if, if you need to come on Friday. All right, um, Julia, do you want me to turn over to Diane? All right, I'll turn the time over to Diane and then we will um, take the last five minutes and introduce the Family to Family Network for those who are unaware. So, oops, I stopped the video. And please let me know if you don't hear Diane or if there are any problems with um, the audio. So, and Diane, right now you're super far away. So if that's okay, because I am, so because I am going to launch the um, PowerPoint on oh, here, launch, okay. so they'll see the PowerPoint full screen. So, okay. all right. So let do you, do you want to introduce yeah. or yeah. Yeah. tell me when to launch? Okay. okay. Yep. Go ahead. All right. So my name is Diane Passy, and I am really excited to be here tonight. I love presenting to groups, and I love presenting to groups of parents who are experiencing some of the really difficult things that I've gone through, because I feel like there's a connection and a bond that happens when powerful parents come together who have similar struggles. And so this is a, a joy and a delight to be here, and I appreciate being invited. We're going to talk tonight about finding the calm in the eye of your storms. And so a little bit about myself. I am an ICF and a CCA certified coach. I work with parents and teens, and I... Um, coach emotional resilience skills. I am passionate about suicide prevention, about um, helping kids who have ADD and some of those other special needs. Um, and this is like what I love to do. I love to get information out there and to help people be able to manage their struggles a little bit better with maybe a few tools that they haven't thought about before, or a few things that maybe are new to them, or just presented in a different way. So we have this awesome picture of this hurricane here, of this storm. Now, interesting thing about hurricanes is that they come in our lives in a lot of different ways. So let's, let's kind of like look at for a minute all the different things that might cause a storm in our life. And I've listed just a few of them here, but there's all kinds and they can come from all places. So we have medical needs, physical, mental, there could be problems and issues with family, financial struggles, educational struggles, especially in the educational system. Um, sometimes there's struggles within our faith, 
and our friends and a community. And we've seen a lot of that recently in the last little while, uh, that struggle with, within our community and feeling, feeling that tension that's within there. But the really cool thing that we know about storms is that in the middle of these storms, there is an eye, an eye of the storm. Now, when you look at this picture here, you'll see the way that the clouds circle around. And in the middle of a cyclone or a hurricane or these storms is what they call the eye. The eye of the storm is usually is a roughly circular area, typically about 90 to 40 miles in diameter. And inside that eye is the place where the most violent winds and rain and, and storm takes place. So what we want to do is oftentimes in our lives, we feel like we are caught up in the storm, whether it be our children's storm, our storm of our own, whatever those struggles are, we find that we get stuck sometimes and we get, we get caught in that eye. So what we want to do is figure out, or we get caught outside of the eye, we want to figure out how to get into the inside of the storm, of the eye of the storm, so that we can observe things from a different point of view than we may be able to see things if we're swirling around in the chaos. Now, I have seven kids, and many of my kids have had special needs of different kinds, and I thought that maybe I had it all figured out with even my first five kids, and my last two kids have had even a more challenging and different types of storms than my first five. But I remember there was a time um, when I had all seven of my kids at home and I sat in the kitchen and I felt like I had a teenager and a two-year-old having a tantrum at the same time. <laughs> and they were about different things and there was all this drama. And I just remember sitting there frozen and thinking, oh my gosh, there are all these storms going on around me. What am I supposed to do? And I reached out to my coach who was helping me with a lot of my teenagers and their struggles at the time. And I said, it's a constant, it's a constant storm at my house. Like, how am I supposed to manage all of this chaos? And she said, Oh, Diane, you've got to sit in the eye of the storm. You've got to be able to. and look at what's going on around it. So one of the things I find fascinating, if we look at this picture of this cyclone here, I just think that's beautiful. And I'm fascinated with clouds when I fly. I always like to fly along the, the, the window so that I can look out on the clouds. But when you see that, it really does look beautiful. You don't see the power and the trauma that comes from underneath the storm. And that's really where I was when I had, this is a picture of me about, this is me and my family about probably 13 years ago. Um, my youngest was, had just been born. And this is that stage where I felt like I was living in a constant storm. I had some teenagers who had addictions. I had a daughter who had um, some, an eating disorder, a serious, serious mental disorder, self-harm, um, anorexia, um, and really like not functioning. And so although this looks beautiful on the outside, we never know what storms people are battling on the inside. And we need to be able to be compassionate about that and be aware that really everybody's storm looks different and it's gonna come across differently. So the benefits of being able to stay in the eye of your storm, I want you to think for a minute if whatever the latest chaos that it was that you were going through, whatever the latest trauma was, whether that be today or an hour ago or last week, what it would have felt like if you could almost step outside of the chaos for a minute and look at it with a different point of view, with a fresh pair of eyes. And somebody like me who is not um, emotionally triggered by any of the things that are happening, what that would feel like. What would I see as someone on the outside coming, come, coming to the inside of your storm? And that's the benefit of being in the eye of the storm. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight is how we get there. So this is my favorite way to describe how brain, how the brain works and the science behind the brain. This is done by 
a fantastic lady. You can find her um, resources. She's wholehearted school counseling. She sells on teachers to teacher to teacher um, online. And I love the way that she she brings this about. I use it with all my clients, with everybody that I work with. So this you can see is our thoughtful turtle. And they call him a turtle for a lot of reasons. We know that the prefrontal cortex of the brain is slow, that it's very methodical, it uses a ton of energy, and that our brain is kind of lazy and doesn't like to go to that, that prefrontal cortex if it doesn't have to. It wants seems to be as, as automated and as easy as possible. But our prefrontal brain is pretty powerful. Only humans have prefrontal cortexes and use that prefrontal part of their brain. So that part of your brain helps us to make smart choices and think before we act. It helps us to set goals and make plans, it problem solves, and it finds solutions. It recognizes and it understands emotion. It treat, helps us to treat ourselves and others with kindness, and it helps us to self-regulate or take good, good care of our feelings. So we, we like this part of our brain. We like to be able to use it and tap into it as much as, as possible. And when we're in that eye of the storm, that is where we're gonna be, is we're gonna be thinking here with our prefrontal cortex. However, we have another really important and necessary part of our brain called the amygdala. This amygdala is represented here by this cute little porcupine. We call him the protective porcupine. And the amygdala are the little almond-shaped glands that you have in your in your brain the amygdala is really important for us to have so it gets kind of a bad rap but but it really is something that's essential for our safety and for our our existence as, as humans so our amygdala watches out for anything that might harm you something interesting to note is that the amygdala cannot tell a difference between real and mental danger so if i i live up kind of by the mountains and if i walk out to my mailbox and a mountain lion comes down racing out of the mount out of the mountains and it's hungry and it wants to eat me my amygdala is going to act the same way as it would if i am getting ready for a presentation or if i'm about to go and meet with a teacher at my child's school and i know that there's a problem and i'm afraid of what they're going to tell me it can't decipher between the two of those so it's just trying to protect me and keep me from harm and then that's why it's a really it's it's really important for our species. However, we don't need him to protect us all the time. We need him to protect us if we really are in danger, but not necessarily if we're not in danger. So it tries to protect and keep you safe. He prepares your body for the fight, flight, and freeze stress response. He creates big emotions. These are emotions are fear, overwhelm. Um, any kind of distress, those are those stress responses. And it shuts down your prefrontal cortex when he's activated, which is going to be a really important thing for you to remember. He is what causes us to sit and swirl inside of the storms that are, that are around us. And so he's going to cause one of three stress responses. The first one is called fight. And it's really interesting what of my clients have fight as their main stress response. But basically, um, clients or people, if we feel like we are able to conquer or to be safe by confronting something that's stressing us, our brain is going to go to the, the fight response. So that's going to look like yelling, screaming, using mean words, hitting, kicking, biting, throwing punches. Um, blaming, not taking any responsibility for the things that we're doing. We are defensive. We make demands or talk back. And it feels like irritability, like you're angry, like you are offended, and you're very aggressive. And you can probably see this response in a lot of smaller kids, especially I see it a lot in toddlers who are learning to, to self-regulate still their, their emotions. So the flight response is really common among the clients I have that are anxious. And that looks like wanting to run away, escape. It's really hard for them to pay attention and focus. And I'll find that this is especially true when they're in school. They will tell me, and I'll listen for these trigger words, like I'll sit in my math class 
And I just can't think about what it is the teacher's telling me. Like, it just doesn't make sense. Like, if somebody were to sit down and explain it to me, I'd get it. But when the teacher's telling me, I just doesn't, and I just feel so overwhelmed. And it's because you can't focus or pay attention. If, this is, if you've got this response going, you're going to feel fidgety, restless, hyperactive, preoccupied, procrastinating. You'll avoid any situation because you're running away. And it's going to feel anxious, panicked, scared, worried, and overwhelming. And you see this little guy right here. He is running away. He's like, I've got to get out of here fast. And he's moving away from what feels threatening because he knows that that is his best chance of survival. The next one is called freeze. And you'll see here this cute little tiger is up against the wall. He's unable to move. He's frozen and stuck. He's like, maybe if I look like a tree, then, or not, not the tiger, the little boy is like, maybe if I look like a tree, then the tiger's going to leave me alone. So that's going to look more like your mind grows blank. It's hard, it's really hard to think. And um, you'll hide or try to be alone. You'll find that kids who feel this or parents who feel like this will isolate themselves. What that looks like for me is I might sit on the couch with my phone, if I get a hunched over position and like try and like, it's almost like I feel like I put the shield around me. I just want to block everything out. I don't want to talk or respond to others if I'm feeling this stress response. And it's really hard for me to complete tasks because really my, my brain is telling me that those tasks aren't there and that they don't exist because maybe then they'll go away. So this feels more like depression. You're numb, you get bored, um, apathetic, you feel helpless and zoned out. Now, this is how we know which part of your brain is at work. And so even though this is directed towards kids, I as adults, I want you to look at this list and think the last time you felt like there was this storm and you were stuck in this hurricane and things were swirling and chaotic and you didn't know what to do, what side of your brain was, was working the most? So if your thoughtful turtle is hard at work, you're gonna have relaxed muscles, steady heart rate, heart rate is gonna be easy to breathe. You're gonna feel calm, focused, curious, ready to learn. You're gonna be setting goals and planning for the future because that all happens in your prefrontal cortex, right? Uh, you're going to problem solve and find solutions, you know, think before you act, and you're going to get along really well with other people. Take good care of your feelings when you have big emotions. You're going to know what to do with them because you're able to logically think it through. Now, if that amygdala, that porcupine part of your brain is the one that is the most active at the time, you're going to feel tense muscles, rapid heart rate. I hear all kinds of symptoms that come from feeling anxious or stressed. Our body has a whole bunch of different stress responses that, that you'll feel. Your thoughts will race and it will be really hard to think clearly. You're gonna feel big emotions like fear, anger, helplessness, anxiety, all of those come and originate from that amygdala. Uh, you're gonna have a difficult time learning, focusing or problem solving. And that really is one of the things that I see in a lot of my clients is, just they can't learn it's not that they it's not that they want to not focus they can't focus because their brain is active in, in defense mode so they have a really oh they do things without thinking first and they have a really tough time getting along with others and i know that when my stress response is up i am prickly and i am going to snap at my husband or snap at my kids for something that's really i really over overreact when things happen when i have that stress response just going. Um, I, so I will be dealing with a stressful situation and it will feel overwhelming. It will feel like it's really, really big and I won't know what to do with it. The best way to look at it, no matter which way that you're feeling, is with curiosity. What is it I'm feeling? How does my body feel? What does it feel inside my body? And, and why? Why am I feeling that way? All right, so this can also be considered a spin level. And I'm gonna to explain to you where we wanna catch things in the spin level. Level zero, that's gonna be the eye of our storm. This is where peace is. You're gonna feel balanced and comfortable and where, of wherever you are. You're just gonna be chill, everything's gonna be good. Level one is your emotion is fleeting, so it might be kind of hard to identify. You can tell something's off, but you maybe don't know exactly what it is or why. 
Um, level two is your emotion. It's just under the surface, but you can still easily brush it off or dismiss it. So that emotion is just kind of sitting right there. A level three spin means your emotion surfaces to your awareness. You know you're angry or stressed, and you may even be able to express how you're feeling. Now, if you are in any of these levels here, zero, one, two, or three, things are good. And you might be feeling like you're being, you know, something's going on, but maybe you're a little bit stressed out that things are happening and you're not quite sure what to do, but you're an easy level to calm back down. I want to be able to help clients get from a level, like if they are in a level three, two, or one, easy to self-regulate and get yourself back down using some of these tools that we're going to talk about in just a minute. All right, level four means your emotion has enough intensity that, it, that you're going to seek for a way to discharge it. Um, it's discomfort by venting, you're going to step over boundaries, you're going to try and control things that are not yours to control. You're going to have a preferred numbing activity. And I'll tell you that we as adults are fantastic at numbing and buffering, and our kids are picking up on a lot of those skills. That is not a necessarily, that's not a good thing. We don't want to numb or buffer anything. If we do, it's going to come right back and it doesn't do any of us any good. So we will go to our favorite activity. That might be eating chocolate. It might be um, video gaming. It might be getting on our phone and scrolling. Like we all kind of have whatever numbing act activity that, that we like doing the best. Uh, we distance ourselves from others. Our thoughts and our conversations are irrational. And you feel crazy because no one understands why you're so upset. You'll be like, oh my gosh, why can't you understand why this is a big deal? And I'll be trying to explain it to people that other people are not getting into my drama and I don't appreciate that. And I need them to get into my drama. So that's a level four. A level five is where your emotion is so intense that you can't think about anything else or even think clearly. You are very reactive and nothing seems to work to get the spin to stop. Things have gone from irrational to obsessive. And what will happen is you will spin from this level five back to a level two or three, five to two or three. And you just end up feeling depleted, alone and ashamed. Like that's a lot of things for your body and your brain to do. And it exhausts you. It just totally depletes you. And as parents with children who have different special needs and different struggles, we need to not be depleted. We need to not have the emotion and the struggle and all of the problems that we have, we, we need to be able to have as much energy and capability as possible to think things through and to act rationally. So once you get up to these level four and five, still possible to get back down to where you're feeling good. It just takes a little bit of work. It takes a little bit more work than if you're at a level one, two, or three, or zero. All right, so we know that when we start to get triggered, it is time to find a way to get in the eye of our cyclone. And like I said, we want to catch ourselves spinning as early as possible. The faster, the better. For my clients, I say, okay, I want you to find your three ways, your top, your first three ways, first three symptoms that you're starting to spiral out. And most people don't know what they are. They know they don't feel good. They know that they are feeling chaotic, but they don't know what it is that that feels like for them. So we want to detect that because if we can detect that first or that second or that third symptom in our bodies that things are getting out of control, it's going to be better. Okay, one of the things that we can do that will help bring us down is that we name our emotions. And in your packet, you're going to have what's called a mood meter. The mood meter was developed by Mark Brackett, who founded the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. And he implements it in elementary schools. And I would love it if every school and every district across the whole country had one of these mood meters. They will put them on walls because what happens is we don't know how to name our emotions. The average person can name 11 emotions. And if I say, tell me what your top three emotions are, then people will, will list as happy, sad, and angry. And those are the emotions that our kids learn growing up. And those are the emotions we use ourselves to describe the way we're feeling. And so because of that, we are not very good at pinpointing how we really feel. Now, I love this, this meter because it's divided up between high, low energy, unpleasant, and pleasant. 
all emotions are good. If you have experienced any of, any of these emotions on this chart, congratulations, you're human, you have a body, and you're not a psychopath because psychopaths are the only ones that cannot experience and feel these emotions. So a high energy, unpleasant emotion is livid. Livid. I had a child who was abused, and I can tell you that is the most angry, angry, angry I have ever been. And so that is my livid moment. There are times that I'm enraged, and there's times that I might be terrified or angry, but that's for me the highest energy, least pleasant emotion. Now, uh, the lowest energy, most unpleasant emotion is despair. We hear people talk about despair when they are have a plan to take their life and when they actually have it, you know, starting to enact that plan. So that is a pretty low. I just can't handle it. I just can't make it anymore. We don't want people down there any more than they have to be. Over here, we have our pleasant emotions, high and low. So the highest pleasant, highest energy, most pleasant emotion that's on here is exhilarated. And I'll ask people like, uh, what is it that you do that, that would feel exhilarating? Some of my young adults will say, oh, like if I do, if I skydive, <laughs> like, well, for other people, that would be terrifying. That's going to be over in this red section. But, uh, uh, you know, going to Disneyland or um, a roller coaster or something like that is just going to feel, you can feel the energy, the energy of that word. Where down here, the most pleasant, least energetic emotion is serene. And I always think of serene, I think of a monk sitting on a rock by a river. Like that's that just always what comes to me. And I always think, man, that must feel so good to be that serene. I don't know if there's a monk sitting on a rock by a river, but that's what that's what comes to my head. So when we identify and name how we feel, it's actually magic happens. And my young adults and the classes that I teach will say, oh my gosh, like what felt like it was this big overwhelming emotion actually feels like it's going to be okay. And I actually feel like I can manage it. This isn't going to be like the horrible thing that happens. Like it's okay. I'm actually just feeling unsure and excluded. Maybe I'm fatigued or anxious, but it's, but I know what it is I'm feeling. So we want to be as specific as possible. And we want to teach our kids to be specific as possible with the way they feel. And the only way that will happen is by you using the vocabulary to name those emotions yourself. If they have never heard the words, they're not gonna know what they feel. And you can do different games with them. You can say, you know, when's the last time you felt confused? And you can tell them the last time you felt confused and allow them to tell you the last time they felt confused. It, just, it justifies, that's not quite the word. It, um, gives them permission to be able to feel that, helps them know that that's just normal. There's nothing wrong with feeling that. There's nothing wrong with feeling restless or annoyed. That's just part of being human. I feel that way. Everybody feels that way. And so teach them the vocabulary to what they really feel. So tonight, tonight I met with a client and she said, I'm just, I'm just anxious. I'm just anxious all the time. I said, okay, so let's dig into this a little bit more. Let's figure out, are you really anxious all the time? And when we start digging into that, people who say that they have anxiety and are anxious all the time, it actually turns out that they have a box of things. And we, we track that and we keep track of that. So I would love it if every parent, and so we have schools that teach um, emotional intelligence in a different way. If every parent had one of these up on their fridge, pointed to it and used it. Now, if you have younger kids, the best thing to do is they have versions of these that have emojis on them so that you can have the kid point to which emoji it is that they relate to and that they feel the most. Okay, the next most popular thing that works best for my clients is called square breathing. Now, there's all different kinds of square breathing. You can find a lot of different helps and ways to do that. We're going to we're going to practice square breathing tonight. But you'll see that this little boy, now these are all in your coping skills for kids handout that, that each of you will have. But you'll see this little boy actually has a racetrack. They have racetrack ones, they have stars. If you go on YouTube, they have a little fish that goes around this, this um, 
square, whatever the shape is called, the square right here. For most of uh, uh, most adults, a square works great. And I recommend if it's possible and you're really, really feeling like, like you're getting really cold into that storm, to try and also trace with your finger as you breathe. And so this is what that looks like. When you breathe in, you're going to fill your belly with air, just like you're filling a balloon with air. And you're gonna do that for four seconds. And then you're gonna hold that air in for four seconds. You're gonna exhale and you wanna get all of the air exhaled out of those lungs. And then you hold it for four seconds. Now, when I get super stressed out and I'm getting pulled into my kid's chaos, <laughs> my my square and my my square breathing sounds like this one two three four one two three four one two three four because I'm just like oh you know super stressed out. What we want to do? I have to count one a thousand between everything. So I'll say one one thousand two one thousand three one thousand four. You can do this in a school room. You could do this while you're driving. You can do it before going to bed. I had one parent that did it in the morning once she brushed her teeth. You can do it while you're eating anytime. This is one of those tools that can be used anywhere and that that people love if we do two to three rounds of this it resets this, that a little amygdala stress response in your brain because it tells your brain you're okay if a tiger was really coming to get you if that mountain lion was chasing me i would not be sitting and doing square breathing so it allows my brain to get the oxygen it needs and it tells me it's okay i'm going to relax and i'm going to be able to come back into the center where i want to be so let's practice that. We're going to do two rounds of it. Um, and, and, and I want you just to notice the way that you feel. Now, if you're at like in level eight stress, I'm going to go, maybe, maybe, maybe it'll go down to a six or even a seven. And every time you do it, it can bring it down just a little bit more. So we're going to start and I'm going to count for you. And we're going to go around this square two times. So here we go. Ready? One, one thousand, two, one thousand, breathe in, one thousand, four, one thousand, hold it. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four. Breathe out, all the air out. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four. Hold it. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four. One more time. Breathe in, breathe in, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, hold it all the way in, and hold it, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, exhale, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, and hold it, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four. Now, if you just take just a minute and think about what it feels like when your body gets enough oxygen and that you are okay. You are okay in this moment. We don't know what's happening in the future and it doesn't matter. We can't do anything about it. It'll figure it out when it comes. But right now, you are okay. All right. We have a lot of these little coping skills that you'll notice on the handout that have different ways of being mindful and having mindfulness practice. My most successful and popular tool that I use for mindfulness for any age um, from kid to adult is called take five. So uh, take five is when we use all five of our senses to be able to just sit and think about what's going on. So right now, if I were to take five, I'm gonna see what can I see right now? And I, if I look around this room here, I see cream colored walls, I see chairs, I see a table, I see people, I see camera, I see, um, I can see the window. All right, what can I smell? Every place seems to kind of have a smell. Somebody <laughs> said, well, I just smells like my house. I'm like, that's great. I can smell like your house. Um, your stinky teenager in a classroom, it can smell like whatever, whatever it is. Then take, take a second, what do you taste? Again, people will say, um, it tastes like mouth. That's great. Or maybe it'll taste like the piece of gum that you just finished chewing. Or it might taste like what you just ate for lunch. You know, the different things it will taste. What can you touch? What is your body sitting against right now? What does it feel like? Is it hard? Is it soft? Is it something that's comfortable? What, 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 are, what are you touching? For me right now, 
my feet are touching the floor. It's standard um, business carpet. Um, I can touch my dress. I can touch this desk that's sitting right next to me. And then what can you hear? Just a moment ago, I heard sirens outside. I sit and listen for a minute. The streets are wet outside. And I can hear cars driving. I can hear cute little baby making sounds. I can hear people with their papers. There's another car out there. By doing that, we pull all of our senses and we become present in the moment. In that moment, it doesn't matter what's going to happen in the future. And it's not going to matter what happens in the past. I'm present in my moment. And now I can observe and see what's going on in my store. So other little things you'll see here, connect with nature. That That's part of the take five. You're gonna go and look, what does the ground look like? What's up in the sky? What does it smell like? What does it sound like? Journal or write a letter. Anything that is tactile is going to be great because you're taking something or you're touching something and it brings you back into the present. So that can be drawing or coloring. It can be journaling. And then we've got things like exercise, stretch, do yoga. And um, this one right here is an interesting one for kids who are not able to have the ability to do yoga or stretch or if you're at school or if you just don't like exercise in general, some adults like this. And you're going to tighten up your muscles really, really, really tight and hold it and hold it and hold it and relax. And you're going to do it again. You can lay down in your bed or just in a classroom and tight, 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 really tight everything you can think of and then relax them and there's a re release that happens when we do that so that's how you can become more mindful some easy tips to do that okay it's really important for me we are now right now in the country this is our high suicide point this is the part where uh, kids start um, um, dying by suicide in high schools where we start seeing a lot more of that we're in the middle of winter we just went through the holidays which was really which is a really difficult season for a lot of people. And I always want to make sure that people have their safe person. A safe person that you can talk to is a coping skill and is a way for you to be able to come back to what is working. Now, I have a couple of clients that they're like, well, when I talk to my friend, she just gets me riled up because she's like, oh yeah, that is her. Oh my gosh, that whole, oh, and then I had this happen. Oh, that's horrible. Oh, you should be so upset at your husband or, you know, whatever. And you guys just get into each other's storms and you have enough storms on your own. You do not need anybody else's storm. So this person that you talk to needs to not be, get pulled into the drama. If you have family drama, do not talk to a family member and get pulled into their drama if you have a storm of your own that you're going through. Um, the perfect person to talk to is gonna help you be able to see things from a different angle and a different perspective and say, yeah. So I understand that, you know, this, that, that your son, you know, he was sent home today because he punched somebody. Like, let's look at it from a different point of view. Let's see, you know, why is it? What the principal's point of view, the teacher's point of view, you know, let's, let's look at this from a different side. And see if we can have a little bit better understanding of it. They are not going to uh, buy into your victim mode. When our amygdala is going and we feel like we are overwhelmed, we go into a victim mode and nothing good happens. Victim mode. Things happen to us, they happen without our control, and we get into a place where we feel like we are helpless and don't have the ability to pull ourselves out. The opposite of victim mode is survivor mode. And that's where we want to be, but we can't be in survivor mode unless we're thinking about it. So we don't want someone to say, oh, yeah, oh my gosh, you are in the worst situation. You're totally right. There's nothing you can do about it. You might as well just go to bed, like just give up. Like you're, it's helpless. And so we don't want that either. Uh, somebody who can show compassion and empathy to you means that they will allow you to sit in your space and they're not going to fix it. So that looks like this. If I have a friend that said, yeah, my husband's in the hospital with COVID. It's not looking very good. I'm not going to be like, well, at least you know this. Well, at least your kids are okay. At least you have a house to live in. At least he's in the best hospital. Brene Brown has a fantastic little video about empathy. And so nothing empathetic ever starts with the phrase at least. So we don't, we don't start that with that. We say, man, that sounds so hard. 
sounds like you're really having a hard time right now. I'm so sorry. And you are willing to sit with somebody in their space instead of trying to fix it. Fixing something never, never helps. And so that's so that's what we want to do. And then we want them to be loving and non-judgmental. I'm not going to tell my somebody who does not have an ADHD kid, ADHD kid about the struggle of an ADHD child in my home, because they're going to be like, wow, that is like, you know, I'm afraid of what their judgment is. It's much easier to tell somebody who I know is going to say, oh my gosh, I so know what that looks like. You go into their rooms and I swear it's like a bomb has gone off in there. It's like the worst thing ever, or I can't read their handwriting either. And I know that they're like 12 and you're supposed to be able to read their handwriting, but I can't either. And, and so I want someone who's going to be able to hold that space. For most people, you're going to need a therapist or a psychologist, a counselor, a coach, somebody who is on the outside looking in. And when you are, if you feel like you're stuck in that hurricane and you can't get yourself out, this is a really, really important step. Doesn't mean you failed. It just means you're going to learn. And it's just a, it's like a different little class. And you're going to be okay. And everything is all right. So talking about it is going to be really important and talking to the right people who aren't going to make it worse. All right, so this are some different options and some different resources I offer. I have a podcast, Come Home to Peace. You can find it on my website as well as any major podcast platform. And I focus on a lot of these parenting skills. My podcast episode that was released today is on failure and the gifts of failure and allowing our kids to fail, which totally sucks. So next week is going to be on grades, and I have a totally different view of grades and the grading system that we use here in the United States than a lot of people have, because I have kids that have some of these special needs. I've had high-performing kids, and I have kids that, <laughs> that, that I'm getting used to a lot of different letters, and they're grades, and, it, and it's okay. It's all right. It's just a letter. You can hear me talking to myself. It's just a letter. It means nothing. It's a letter of the alphabet. All right, this is my website, Come Home to Peace. You can find me on Instagram and on Facebook. And I am starting up a Remarkable Mamas Mentoring group for any parents who have kids with special needs. It's going to be a 16-week group, and we're going to meet weekly. Um, it is by, it's, I'm keeping the enrollment of that super small, and I need to meet with parents first to make sure that they are the right fit for the group. So that you would contact me on my website, at my email, on my social media site to see if that would be something that would fit for you. So make sure that you realize there are help. There is help and there's resources out there. You can stay in that eye of the storm. When I've been able to stay in the eye of the storm, I look around at the things swirling around me. I look at the inside of the cyclone and it's like magic. I can pick which problems are the most important problems, which ones need to be solved right now, which ones can I just let swirl? If I've got my teenager and my toddler both having a tantrum at the same time, do I need to step into their storm to fix it? Or can I let that swirl and I'm going to sit and I'm going to choose what I want? What I, what's the most important thing for me to do? It's really important skill for those of us who have special needs kids and who have um, these storms that are surrounding us. So so learn that however you do find the resources that you need in order to become the best parents that you can be so thank you now are there any questions i know we have some virtual i know either of you guys have any questions okay okay you're good any questions from the virtual land any specific concerns or something that we don't have anybody yet that is posting. Okay. Um, you are welcome to again email me if you have questions and say, hey, I saw you on this presentation. Can you help me know how to handle this situation? I don't have all the answers and I am not going to be the right um, coach for everybody, but I can direct you to who is and I can help you find the right coach or the right the right therapist or psychologist there's not like there are things that i just don't do um and so yes yes so there's a question on the chat how do you sit in someone's storm with them but not reinforce their victimhood 
Isn't that, that is a great, great question. All right, so let's, so let's set this up. So my friend is, is gonna come and talk to me and she's gonna say, oh my gosh, this thing happened. In fact, this happened this last week, Let, let's do this. I had a friend call me and say, my son is getting kicked out of the junior high because he keeps getting in fights. And I just, I mean, she was mad. She was really angry about it. She lives in Grantsville. She's like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with them and I don't know. And so curiosity is the best first tool that you want to do. Really? So kind of tell me a little bit more about that. Wow, oh, that sounds like that would be really frustrating. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? What are your options out there? Would you like some suggestions? Would you like to see things from a different point of view? And sometimes I don't. Sometimes when you're in the storm, you don't want to hear what anyone says. You want to feel validated and feel like what you're saying is okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. You can sit in someone's storm and just sit there. I sometimes just clench my teeth. I am not always great at not giving my opinion because I would like to fix everything. But sitting in someone's space means sitting there and being uncomfortable with them and saying, yeah, that sounds like that's rough. Man, I don't know. I'm so sorry that he's experiencing this, that he's been in all these fights. That just would, he's, he sounds like he would be in a lot of pain. And it sounds like you are trying to find the right path for him. So, you know, um, I'll be praying for you or I'll be thinking about you. Let me know if you would like my help somehow. But I hope that answers the question. Is that, is that, yeah, if they, if they respond back to that, let me know if that answers it. Yes. Okay. I know it's really helpful for me when somebody says, somebody that I've come to talk to about my problems, when they say, you know what, that sounds really hard because then I feel validated. I feel, you know what, this is hard. Thank you for appreciating that. Um, and it's also kind of an expression that you can use that doesn't get you mixed up in all of the drama. Mm -hmm. it, I also like it when people say, would you like, would you like help or do you just want to talk? Mm -hmm. like, and, and specifying. People, and when people ask me that question, then I have to think about it. I'm like, you know what? I just want to talk. I don't want any advice right now. And as you know, as a helper, so many of us in this in this community are helpers in this space here because we know what it's like to feel uncomfortable. We know what it's like to go through some of these difficult experiences. And we want to help. We want to be like, oh my gosh, I know just the person for you. And Sometimes I have to think of it, which hat would you like me to wear right now? Is this my mom hat? Is this my um, coach hat? Is this my friend hat? Is this like, like how, how can I best help you tonight? What would you like? What kind of support would you like from me? And so being really clear, because we might think we know what they want, but we probably don't. And asking is the best way to find out. Thank you for sharing that. So well, there's a question that came directly to me that says, how do you find a good counselor or a therapist? Okay, so this, this is tricky. I'll tell you, this is what I think about a good counselor or therapist. It's going to be one that your child connects to and one that doesn't just do talk therapy. And I'll tell you, it is a little bit tricky to find one that will connect with your child, that your child's willing to talk to, and doesn't just sit and let them tell their things over and over again. It's actually gonna give them tools to work with. And that can be hard. I would ask friends, I would ask other people in the in the profession. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can ask me, you can ask um, a school principal, you can ask your pediatrician for recommendations, but it is a tricky thing to find. Um, I'll tell you right now, people in this mental health space are burned out and they are dealing with a huge client load of people who have really been hurting for the last two years and they're doing the best they can, but it's still, there is something that happens if you can find someone that your child will connect to and is willing to go and talk to, that's your first step. Um, I felt like with my teenagers, as we went through different uh, therapists and especially when they were younger, it, it's tricky and I almost had to like feel out the therapist or the counselor first because I knew I didn't have unlimited shots. I could not take this child who was already difficult and struggling and say, yeah, let's go visit four therapists and you tell all of them your story and open up to all of them and then pick which one is your favorite. Like that's just not gonna, that's just not gonna work. So do your homework, uh, research out, do not pick randomly out of 
you know, uh, uh, it used to be phone book. I don't know what people use now, but ask, ask around. Google. <laughs> well, yeah, Google, <laughs> not Google uh, therapist. Um, the other thing is if you can get into one that specializes in children and, and adolescents, depending on the age of your kids, and that's even more specialized and can be a little, even a little more tricky. Ask questions, ask them how often they, how many of their client load are um, clients that are dealing with the same struggles that you're dealing with and know that you may have a little bit of a wait to get into some of the really good ones. Diane, the, the district, Twila County School District has put out a mental health therapist list. Oh, fantastic. Um, and right now the district has a mental health grant. And so these are the, um, the counselors and therapists that um, partner with the, the school district um, with their mental health grant. So they can be, the, the children can be seen in school or um, through this mental health grant, or you can see them privately Fantastic. through your insurance. And now, I can send that document yeah, to anybody yeah, who needs it. Definitely send that out so they at least have somewhere to go. Now, I also believe that all the high schools this year are, again, I don't know if it's the same grant, they're doing the mental health screenings that you sign up for a 20, 30 minute block of time. There will be the therapist there at your high school. You can sign up for that and they can, they can talk to you again. This is a very high risk mental health time. It was uh, about this time of year that we lost our first uh, high school student. And then we lost one from each high school within about 30 days. So we want to catch this. We wanna catch these kids and help them. And so it's better to try something than nothing. Mm -hmm. And you might not get it right. You may not pick the right one that your child's gonna connect with, but you're gonna regret not putting forth some kind of an effort. So we take, like I take mental health very, very seriously. And uh, we have to save, we have to save these kids' lives. I will try and find that um, paper while we're talking. Yeah, and, and look through for, if you are in the county, look in your peach jar. Can't, um, emails that you were sent that you got this, you know, for many of you got the same hand up or the same advertisement through Peach Star. I think that's where I remember seeing the signups, at least for my high school out in Grantsville. And um, so I'm sure there's gotta be something. I have a suicide um, coalition, pre prevention coalition meeting that it's not for a couple of weeks. So I'm not sure exactly where and when they all are. And we do have another question to, let me get back to it. Um, tools to not get pulled into drama with your kids when that's what they want. Yes, they do. Because kids would love everybody to be on their side. I know, and this is from having seven kids and not all parents are gonna feel like this, that there's gonna be a portion of what they tell me that's true and a huge percentage of what they tell me that's not true. I always listen to them and I listen to it with curiosity and as a detective would listen to it and I think, okay, I know that their point of view is very valid to them. This is really how they see things. This is, this is a very realistic um, problem that they have, but your responsibility as a parent is to show your kid how to be in that eye of the storm. So let's let's say, okay, you know what? Let's do some square breathing for a minute. <laughs> Let them talk it out, sit in their space with them, and then say, you know, let's just take a little walk, come back, and then let's talk about this again. Show them what it's like to pull yourself and de you know, de-escalate it, bring it down a little bit, and then talk about it and know that. Their brains are, they are so worried about what their parents and their peers and their teachers think that their brains do skew things to be a certain, a certain way. So you cannot trust what they say. So um, just part of it will always be true. And you get to decide which part and what you want to believe. But if I have one of my kids come and tell me this big dramatic thing that happened on the bus, I will say, wow, yeah, well, that sounds, that sounds hard. What are you going to do about it? And I put it, give the power back to them. Huh, what do you think the right thing is in this situation? And let them have it. I don't have to take it just because it's a problem. Uh, it doesn't mean it's my problem, but I can help them if they want advice. Sometimes they just want to talk about it. Um, one of the number one things I hear from teenagers is their parents don't listen to them. 
So, so just listen to them and say, wow, yeah, that sounds hard. What are you going to do? I'm so sorry. There's great suggestions. Thank you. And exactly. thank you for the exactly. suggestions. So there's, there's some feedback yeah, on that. Eddie? Yes. So you talk about um, staying calm. Um, how do you do that when you're like constantly becoming referee? So, or whatever it is, all of the little storms that are swirling around, how do you do that? So kids will, and teenagers will get, they get, whether it's positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement, it's still a dopamine hit. And if they know that they can get your attention and they can get that dopamine hit from you taking care of their problem, then they will absolutely use that. And so, you know, a lot of these problems, they have to figure out themselves. Somebody, I don't know if they're more like, what, what, what age kids are we talking about here? Um, well, All of them? Yeah, like, so five through 17 is what we've got. Okay, and so a lot so of- It just depends on the dynamic. Mm -hmm. You know, it might be the 14-year-old taking on the five-year-old because, so when you throw it back to them and this goes back this is really hard okay this is hard as a parent not to take responsibility and i'll tell you why it's tricky for our brain if we take responsibility for our kids drama then we feel like we have control we don't have control over it but we feel like we have control so we feel like we're doing something when we're trying to referee, when really those kids are gonna do and make choices and you may or may not be able to solve their problem. So if someone comes to me and say, okay, so we have a lot of bugging in my house right now. Um, I know, like, look, I'm having an anxiety attack just thinking about the bugging that happens, but we have a lot of bugging and, and bugging each other. There's one particular kid who's very loud <laughs> and he gets bugged. And so he's really fun to bug. And so, um, <laughs> I my, my daughter over here and she's laughing because she she was the bugger when I had all seven of my kids at home. And so she was the one that quietly bugged. But um, when, like if it's a matter of safety and someone's going to get hurt, we can separate them and say, yeah, wow, you know, it sounds like that didn't go very well when you tried to take that toy. What are you going to do next time? What do you think you could do better next time? Or how do you think you can handle this? I have um, two teenage clients that I work with in the same family. And this little, and this girl, she's nine. She was like, oh my gosh, my brother is bugging me so much. I just can't handle it. I just can't control it. I want to take away his Christmas present. I don't want to give it to him. It's like, well, you know, what if you wrapped his Christmas present in his stinky socks and you came up with a creative way to give it to him to make him laugh? Like, what could you do to make this fun? And turn it around. And what can she do? We're going to have people bug us and irritate us. Like people bug us at school and at jobs. So teach them some skills to manage it, but you don't have to manage it. And you, you feel control when you do, but really there can be chaos and you can stay centered and turn on some peaceful music or you know, uh, change the situation, do something goofy that's gonna make everyone laugh, you know, change the environment somehow to try and get that to, to de-escalate a little bit. Does that make sense, Stephanie? Okay, so it's gonna be- I might need more skills on that. You can hit me up after and we'll talk about some more things to do. It's hard as a parent. It is really hard to not get pulled in. And our kids, the older they get, I've got three married kids and then one young adult. Um, oh my gosh. Like I didn't even realize like how much more drama that would add to my life. And it's really hard to stand back and allow them to do that. And it's going to mean allowing them to fail and to make choices that I don't agree with. And to call and tell me all the things I have, one of my kids that calls me all the time with a lot of with a lot of things that are going on and sitting in the space and not getting pulled into it takes a lot of practice, but it's the only way I can mentally survive. And she doesn't want me to solve it. She just wants me to listen. And so does that help a little bit? Okay. Diane, that's something that I had to learn with one of my oldest too, is she did not want advice she did not want me to fix anything she just wanted to vent and she and it took me a long time to recognize and realize that so i appreciate you saying that yeah yeah any other questions or follow-up or 
as we talk. Is that we hit covered about everything? Hopefully. Did, did you launch the poll, Julia? Or do you okay? Okay. Well, I have, I sure appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. If anybody who is watching this would like me to come and speak to a community group or a classroom, or I will fit it in. I I am quite busy with my speaking schedule, but I love spending spreading this message of emotional resilience as much as possible. So I am happy to do that. I do that for free, free of charge, and um, you know just just message me and let me you know let's let's find out a time that we can do this because this is where power comes when we come together as parents and we figure this out we're all making it up right now as we go and it's okay it's okay to be in that space and not know what you're doing so so thank you thank you so much thank you diane thank you and i just wanted to mention again um julia posted the um description of the Utah Parent Center, the Family to Family Project. Um, and I really want to highlight our um, our Facebook group we have in Tooele County. Um, we do have a Tooele County Family to Family Network page. Um, I will post Family to Family Network. So you'll just want to search in Facebook. Um, uh, Twella County Family Family Network, and, and you'll find it, and you'll have to ask to join, and I can approve that. Um, but I encourage you to be on there uh, to, like Diane was saying, to brainstorm, to um, really think about, you know, and ask, and what what sorts of helps can we find um, by pooling together our brains as, you know, a community, and. Um, it's very powerful. I, my daughter is 22 now, my special needs daughter. Um, and that's quite honestly, it's how I've gotten through life is being able to brainstorm and to bounce ideas and to, um, I was thinking as Diane was posting the, your, your person that you can pull into. And I was like, my, my good friends that I, my daughter has grown up you know, with them, that's who my person is. That's who I call. And, and, and they tick every one of those marks. And I just felt immense gratitude because I, I was so grateful that I did have that person this whole time and, and realizing what that they have done for me. So, um, I, I really hope that that's something that we can all do is find that person that, um, will mark, you know, check all those boxes. So, um, I really appreciate again you coming and how's the poll, Julia? Should we be good? A few more. Push. <laughs> we have a few more people that need to answer the poll. Um, but I'll just explain kind of what I do for the district um, and what each parent consultant does um, through the Utah Parent Center. So we're at, with the Utah Parent Center, we're a statewide organization. Um, and we're nonprofit and we work off of the family to family model. So all of our parent consultants and actually most of our admins <laughs> have children, um, with special health care needs or disabilities. So, so we come from that understanding of we, you know, of course, each child is not going to be exactly the same, but we've kind of been in that area, um, that's that many families can recognize the stress of having a, a special needs child the um the thank you uh julia for posting that um so so what we can offer is you know the one liner that i like to use is we mentor other families so i can help navigate commute through community resources through um, school resources. So um, most likely your child might be on an IEP or a 504 uh, through the school district. I can help with any communication um, that's needed. Uh, we do have several different uh, parent consultants that are contracted with school districts throughout the state. Um, Tuella just happens to be one of them. 
And so I have, I'm in a unique position that I know people in the district and I, and then working with families, I can help guide the families through um, Tooele districts, um, you know, navigation where you need to go. Maybe you need to take a next step. Um, you've, you've tried the teacher, you've tried the principal, um, maybe it's time to talk to the district now. So I can help with those um, communications and, and facilitate a, a conversation when you, you, you know, parents may not feel like they're getting heard. Um, so, so I really um, want to encourage it to check out our website as well, utahparentcenter.org. We have some fantastic resources on there and some webinars that are pre-recorded. And we also have a YouTube site as well. Um, so with that, um, if there are uh, no more questions or concerns, um, oh, Davis County, I did want to highlight this. Thanks, Karen, because uh, she put it in the chat. This was a really good uh, network meeting in Davis County that's happening on January 13th. That's positive interactions with the law enforcement. So that I, I saw that on our events calendar and um, I did think that that was a great one that's coming up because um, I think that's a really important um, meeting workshop for our families. So please check our events page on the Utah Parent Center website and you can uh, see how to uh, log on to that. But I will... We'll say good night for now and, and please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much.